Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Lisa Jacobson to the show. Lisa Jacobson is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, a 55-member trade association representing the energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy industries. In this role, Ms. Jacobson advises states and federal policymakers on energy, tax, air quality, and climate change policy. She is a member of the Department of Energy's State Energy Efficiency Steering Committee, the United States Trade Representatives Trade and Environmental Policy Advisory Committee, the Energy Efficiency Global Alliance Steering Committee, and the Gas Technology Institute's Public Interest Advisory Committee. Lisa, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity and joining your podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for joining. Lisa, where are you currently located? I am located in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., and it is a beautiful day out today. And that's what I was going to ask, how the weather was. I appreciate you (laughs) answering that. (laughs) It's nice. So, Lisa, I like to open the show by asking my guest the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that this is, you know, so interesting, but it's certainly something that I value at this time where, you know, we're dealing with COVID-19 and, and the restrictions in our, in our life. I'm a music lover and um, I, you know, that's really been keeping me going, but I miss live musical um, events. And so I hope we can have them soon. So it may not be that novel, but it's true. Do you play music? Uh, not well. <laughs> I'm a good <laughs> music listener. What do you play when you're not playing it well? Uh, piano. And have you been playing it during the past year? Not that much. You know, we don't have a piano in my house right now. So no, I have not. Maybe something to look forward to. Right. I mean, that, that goes in. The, I also want to learn how to play guitar. So I do have a guitar and I've taken lessons, but I've, with children and other things, fallen off the practicing. So maybe that's a more realistic uh, music goal for the coming year. So I've heard and read that guitar sales have been at an all-time high during the pandemic. Yes, I, I believe that. And I know a lot of people that are doing online lessons. That's been mm-hmm. something that has been fairly easy to transition, I think, to the v- virtual um, virtual learning situation. So um, yeah, now, now I you got me thinking. I got to get back <laughs> to it. Well, good for you. The reason I'm saying that is because my, my oldest daughter, she... Um, picked up guitar this summer and she asked me to buy her an app called, I think it's called Usical. And um, mm-hmm. she's really been enjoying self-teaching herself uh, using the application. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Of course. That. You're welcome. So Lisa, switching gears, can you give the audience an overview of the BCSE and your role at the organization? Sure. I'd be happy to. So BCSE stands for Business Council for Sustainable Energy. And it's a trade association. We're based in Washington, D.C., and it focuses on promoting policies that, you know, expand um, deployment and investment in mostly commercially available clean energy technologies. And the industries that we work most closely with are energy efficiency industries, natural gas industries, and renewable energy industries, though our networks and our membership are involved in pretty much all technologies at this point and are looking to, you know, advance and uh, commercialize a next wave of sustainable energy technologies. In my role, I serve as the president and I had the opportunity to work um, at the organization right when I got out of graduate school as the director of international programs, but then left and came back um, when my 
predecessor left. This was now a good number of years ago and have been serving as the president uh, for over a decade. So what does the organization do for the members? Well, we serve as a conduit for policymakers primarily. We try to share information about technology change in our economy, especially in the energy sector, and then you know, work with our members to craft policy recommendations that are um, you know, focused, again, on cost-effective deployment of clean energy. And you said earlier, mostly commercial. Is that correct? Right. So things that are readily available and in the market today. Now, on occasion, do you have the opportunity to deal with technologies that are not commercialized yet? Yes. Because again, I, I think, you know, if you look at our membership, we have you know, very different types of entities as members. So we'll, we may have, you know, public power or investor owned utilities. We might have large energy, uh, energy service companies. So large ESCOs or energy integrators, and they're going to use all different kinds of technologies. You might have, um, project developers that use multiple technologies. And then you have either industrials or equipment manufacturers that might make a particular technology. So it it's, gets us in most, uh, most technology arenas. Um, but I, when we're talking with policymakers and the mission of the organization is really, let's make sure that when we're thinking about policy, that we are fully utilizing commercially available technologies that get the job done. Now, Early this year, there was a lot of issues with the tech companies and, you know, how some of the, should I say, lawmakers are not up to speed on technology. I noticed one of the things that the council does is offer practical industry expertise to policymakers. Can you share how the council does that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we do that. But I mean, one way is just one on one interaction. I mean, right now that's happening in a virtual way. but Normally, there's a lot of in-person, small group interactions with both, you know, policymakers like the officials themselves, like a member of Congress or a senator um, or someone working at the state or city level, but also their staffs. I mean, another way that we communicate is we develop resources. And so one of the resources that we've developed over the last 10 years is something called the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. And that is a report we commission each year from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And it's meant to show over time the real rapid transformation that the U.S. energy sector has experienced. And through data, you know, show how technology costs have changed or show how deployment trends have evolved um, or show kind of metrics about uptick in certain types of policies. And, it, you know, we try to be very up to date with this. Um, but we find that still a lot of policymakers have not maybe perhaps a deep understanding of our energy systems or our energy marketplace. But more importantly, things are changing so fast that even if they were generally up to speed, it may be as they're looking ahead and they're trying to craft policies that will make change in, in years to come that they don't have the most up to date information. And this is particularly important on technology costs where we've seen very uh, steep declines, in particular in renewable energy technologies. And if, if you aren't aware of that, especially in your own uh, jurisdiction, you may have a different outlook on a different policy proposal. Now, you've been with the organization for quite some time. While not asking you to pick any favorites, what are some of the technologies that you've been most interested in? <laughs> well, you know, I love all the technologies that I work with. <laughs> um, I, but there clearly are a few. I mean, you know, I'll pick one that maybe not many people are aware of. And it, it kind of is like energy where I think most people just look at the switch and turn it on and off and they see their bill and they pay it. And, you know, maybe they're paying attention to what's behind the switch. But oftentimes, um, you know, the, the, basically that's the way our society had been structured. It's like energy on demand. It's reliable. Hopefully it's affordable and it's there for you 24-7. That's the goal. Not Now in the last 20 years, there's definitely much more of an emphasis about the energy mix and what its impacts are on society. And we certainly care about how it's 
you know, interacting with other sustainability objectives. So I, I'll pick a technology called waste to energy technology, where they're taking um, waste streams and making renewable energy out of it. And I didn't really know very much about this or very much about our waste management policies as a country or even in the community that I live in. But I had the opportunity a good number of years ago to actually visit one of these facilities locally. And it just, you know, really opened my eyes. I was, you know, I we, we talk so much about, you know, how to be better stewards. And at a household level, some of the first things you do relate to your garbage and recycling, you know, and but where does all that go? And so I was really enamored with um, the sophistication of that technology. And so for me personally, it's just something that I would put up there as maybe something you don't know very much about, which would be good to check out. You know, it's interesting you mentioned waste energy. It's actually one of the areas that we as a company specialize in. So oh, this wasn't, this that. wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't planned by any means, but yes, absolutely. We, the majority of waste to energy projects that take place in the United States, United States come across our desk in one form or the other. Okay. So, yes. Well, we should talk separately about that because, as, as I said, we have a few members in that sector, but also, I, you know, it's just a, a really interesting conversation. So I look forward to learning more about your company and talking more about it with you. Absolutely. And the other part you mentioned regarding people turning on the switch but not knowing what's behind it, just last month, so I live in a, um, I guess, a master plan community, and we have a co-op where we buy our get our power from. And just last month, they sent uh, they sent a monthly magazine. The co-op is called CoServe, and the magazine featured on the front page just how much of the energy they're buying from renewables. So, I don't know if it's coincidence. I don't know if it's, if it's because of the upcoming election, but it just seemed to you know play out that way. That just this month or last month, they happened to mention renewable energy. That's fabulous. I mean, I, I think it it's a, it's bits and pieces happening at the same time. But I think it's largely driven by the fact that renewable energy and other clean energy resources, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, were not as competitive as they are today. And now they are. So it's a real, the educational component of what you just said um, is there. But it also is an expression of the fact that this is achievable. And, you know, the association is probably driven by, you know, interested members and also, the fact that they could get more renewable energy in an affordable way if they want to. So, yeah, it's great. I think absolutely. And I think as more b people become aware, whether it's through public campaigns, education, you know, in some cases also children in school learning about it, whatever that looks like. But I think the more people that become aware of it, they can ask better questions perhaps about where the energy is coming from. And to the other point regarding the waste part of it, you know, I know I've had several conversations we have a recycling program here, but not everything that we put in the recycling goes into recycling. So that, that's a whole other can of worms that absolutely people are interested in. That they, you know, they should they can do further research regarding what their waste management programs are. Definitely. I mean, I don't want to start plugging particular shows, but there was, and I believe, and we can edit this out if we need to. But I believe no, no, there was a frontline, away. Um, a frontline documentary on plastic that I watched. One of the things I watched over you know, the, the quarantine period. And I was just so dismayed um, because I'm definitely one of these people that is like telling my kids, we got to rinse it out. We got everything, you know, I'm really into recycling because I feel like it's something that I can do. But when I saw how much plastic and how much, and then going to the grocery store and seeing that everything basically that's there, that's in plastic is not currently recycled in many parts of the country, let alone the world was really disturbing. Um, and maybe that's not all true, but I, I, you know, definitely it was a really good show to watch and it was very thoughtfully done and it wasn't trying to be scare tactics. It was about um, just really understanding in the, the world of plastic, right? So, but the other thing I would say, if we're going to talk about waste to energy and you probably have um, good information to share too, is that as I understand it, you know, waste to energy, not everyone may be, um, having waste to energy options in their community. But those that do, for the most part, have very, very high recycling rates. Um, so if there was ever kind of a question like, okay, well, if we're doing waste to energy, are we not recycling? No, I think they go very much hand in hand. And um, I just would want to share that too. Absolutely. And I think, 
you know, to mention the plastic specifically, I think that's the one that becomes most disheartening for people when they realize that so much of their efforts have been essentially in vain. But on the other side of that coin, I really feel like getting that habit in from now. So when things do improve, I think it's a great way to start. So I definitely understand how people feel almost misled that, you know, I've been rinsing and cleaning for all these years and it just ends up in the same place. And, you know, Frontline did a good job and there are other shows out there that, you know, have highlighted the problem. But I feel like um, the habit is a good habit regardless. Well, yeah, it's mindfulness. I mean, so at least on our end, we can be mindful. And hopefully, as you said, we can get the systems and economics in a place where what is what what we can reuse we are reusing um but yeah so that that's not my area of expertise believe it or not even though we spent so much time on it but um that is a technology that i really appreciate and are seeking to learn more about and you mentioned mindfulness and i'm a huge fan of mindfulness so i'm sure that could be a whole show in itself but i appreciate you pointing that out so i'm going to change gears here you know you've been running this organization for a while now my question to you is why? I'm sure you've had other opportunities, but what motivates you? What drives you to keep doing so? Well, I think this waste to energy example is actually a really good um, illustration. I mean, I find I'm learning every day in my job, and there's much more that needs to be done in terms of the broad mission that we that we share collectively as a coalition in terms of improving our environment and progressing sustainability. And um you know, the technologies and the business models evolve, the market conditions evolve, the policy environment um, evolves. So it's, it's in some ways, we are having similar conversations um, on some aspects of our work, but so much of what we're doing is very dynamic. So it's just an exciting place. And it is multiple technologies. And now much more than maybe, you know, 10 years ago, multiple sectors. I mean, we still are primarily power sector focused as an organization, but, you know, transportation uh, is much more integrated into the work of my members. And then, you know, a whole systems approach and, you know, grid integrated buildings and then connection to transportation, like this whole next wave of what um, our infrastructure can look like, you know, takes you outside of a, you know, just kind of a pure electricity focus. Um, And you start thinking about, you know, more, more aspects of our infrastructure. And I think that's really exciting. And then, you know, technology, um, not just energy technologies, but digitalization and how that is changing the marketplace, not just for energy, but um, throughout our economy as a whole is really exciting. So I also think people are, you know, more aware back to what you were saying. I just think it's a really exciting time to be working in the energy field, whereas maybe 20, 30 years ago, I mean, even myself, I didn't think I would be working on energy policy. I just kind of happened upon it, given some things that were going on in my life. But I was I was one of those people, right? You know, I just turn the switch on and I pay my bill. And yes, I care about the environment, but I was not very informed or thinking of energy policy as a real dynamic space. I thought of it maybe more as a technical arena um, and not you know, kind of a people-focused transformational opportunity, which I I definitely see it that way now. So if you don't mind sharing, how did you come upon it? So I started my career working um, as a congressional aide in Washington, D.C. I started interning when I was in college and came down, had the opportunity to come to Washington. And I really loved the work and could see that someone at a young age could make a difference. And working for different legislators. I got a lot out of it. But my focus at the time was much more domestic um, education and healthcare policy. But I was always interested in sustainability and um, wanted to kind of make a shift to international policy work. And so I went to graduate school and I focused my degree on um, global trade and global development issues. And then while I was there, I reviewed a a thesis from one of my my classmates, and it was on emissions trading and environmental economics, which I knew a little bit about, but I didn't know a lot. And it just really was interesting to me. And it was also right before a major environmental conference, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was 
the following year after I graduated from grad school and I just wanted to be a part of it. I mean, it was a combination of a lot of things I was interested in, in terms of development and trade policy and also kind of the meatiest global environmental issue. And I also wanted to work with the private sector because I think um, whether you're working directly in the capacity that I am now, or you're working with another, uh, you know, either public or private or NGO entity. I mean, just the integration of the private sector is just critical for the transformations that we're trying to make. So, you know, that's how I ended up, you know, working in the uh, energy field. So my research shows that you've been in this field, broadly speaking, for about 15 to 16 years. While you were answering, you said there you've always had an interest in sustainability. Where does that interest come from? I don't know, just growing up. I, you know, I just think, also you talk about education. I'm sure it was something that was presented in, and integrated into my family life and, you know, my, my early education. I'm not going to date myself too much here, but <laughs> I was, um, you know, a seventies child. So, you know, my first decade, I was born in 1969. You don't, you could delete it if you want. I don't really care. But, you know, I was, that's what was going on um, in New York when I was growing up. You know, it was a lot of focus on the environment as well as other issues. So in formative years, I'm sure I was exposed to that. And it just made me interested in trying to understand what sustainability would mean and, and how I could participate in it. Well, I appreciate your openness, Lisa. So on this journey, let's say 15 years now, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you've would say you've learned about yourself? I think I'm fairly persistent and, you know, I try to be a good listener. I'm sure I could improve there. Um, you know, I, I had some really good first uh, bosses, you know, or supervisors and uh, mentors. And they, I think, gave me a really good foundation for the work that I do now. And they were hard driving, but very inclusive and, you know, inspirational people in, in and of themselves. So I think, you know, just having that foundation as I moved into different parts of my career, you know, it's helped me adapt and remain a positive outlook. I mean, I think that that really is probably at the end of the day, the most important thing in, in life is just trying to maintain a positive outlook um, and bring that positive outlook to other people and to the things that you're doing. So I think I generally have a positive outlook. If you ask me a question, I'm usually going to pivot on the positive side <laughs> or try to have that kind of, you know, it's just the, the way I try to, I don't even, it's not something I do intentionally. It's just something that I think is a part of the way I cope with life, you know? I hear you. And that resonates very strongly with me. So I appreciate that. Now, again, on your journey here, You've seen quite a transition from when you started to where we are right now, especially in the clean energy, renewable energy move, movement. What are some of the aha moments or surprise moments that you've seen? I think, again, the, if you had said 15 years ago, you know, what corporations would do in terms of renewable energy procurement and deployment, that would have definitely surprised people. Um, and it all is tied to the cost reductions in the sector. So those are definite aha moments. Like, you know, there's still people that question, um, you know, whether clean energy is affordable or practical um, or, you know, attainable. But I, I think, you know, especially the fact book, if you look at the data and this fact book I mentioned, I mean, it's just, if you look at the top line metrics, it's pretty amazing what, what the facts are about clean energy. And it's very different than when I first got into the field. Um, and that's just tremendously exciting. And I will put a link to the fact book in the show notes. Oh, great. Thank you. Absolutely. So Lisa, it's 2025. What does the future hold for BCSE? I hope that we are moved beyond, you know, kind of the stepping stone we are in right now on policy. And we have more longer term policies that will guide investment. So hopefully, so we're at 2021 almost now, right? So in four years, my hope is that we are kind of in the next phase of investment in the energy sector. And again, it is not just, you know, 
narrow, but also like integrating energy in all these systems. So hopefully if those policies, this next wave of policies are in place, you know, we'll be uh, in the business of, of building and hiring and implementing. Sounds like a beautiful vision. So well, last we'll get there question. together. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Shoulder to shoulder, willing to do so. So last question. And you mentioned earlier, you mentioned the word mindful. You mentioned intentionally. You mentioned having a positive outlook. I'm sensing a theme. But last question is, if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, it could be professional or personal, what would it be? Well, I think right now we're all, you know, again, it'd be interesting. I don't think this would change if you come to me in two or three years. But I think for most people right now, this circumstance we're in is like a reset moment on what really matters in life. I mean, what really matters is your health and your family and your friends, right? So, you know, just really trying to be the best person you can be in those relationships is, and that's not always easy. Uh, it's not easy for me, um, but to, to try and, you know, and then I would say, you know, from that is just do what, if, if you're fortunate enough to know what kind of makes you happy in life, try to integrate that into your professional circumstance. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always amazed, unrelated to anything I do, like, you know, whether it be just kind of a profile of somebody or just hearing somebody's story and, you know, they may have nothing to do with what I'm doing and you hear how they got there. And it's just like, well, you know, it's just, I felt this way about a, a topic or an issue. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like five, 10 years later, and they've created a whole life for themselves based on that feeling or that passion. And that to me, and I don't feel I have completely done that in my life or anything. I mean, these people are really inspirational, but what it tells you is that, yeah, maybe anything you want to do, you really can do if you try and really carve that path out for yourself. It takes tremendous persistence and um, I'm sure, you know, lots of challenges along the way, but, but people do do that. And that's inspiring to me. So I don't know what the next career I'll have will be, but I, I try to think about that sometimes. Like, you know, just because I'm not uh, in the medical field right now, or I don't play an instrument right now, like, you know, what are the, not that I'm going to be a professional musician, but you get it. Like, just, <laughs> like, there's lots of things in life to do and your work is important. So if you can integrate your passions with your work, that's terrific. But even if you're not, you know, just continue to strive to try to understand what motivates you as a person and, do as much of that as you can with the time you have. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think your story is inspiring. And I hope you get back to the piano and <laughs> actually pick up, yeah. get to get, get to the guitar. I so enjoyed speaking with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? No, just thank you. And, you know, appreciate your interest in the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Before we go, I'm excited to share that we've launched our comic strip, The Adventures of Mira and Nexi. You can find the first issue at our website, nexuspmg.com, under the Original Content tab. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.